shines with a promise, Emmanuel. In one child born in the stillness, living within us, Emmanuel. Sing His glory, glory. Let there be peace. Let worship service let's kick things off let's stand in together let's lift our hands and lift our voices to the lord in praise
what a message this morning, church. That we are known by God, that we have been chosen out by God. We are saved through the grace of Christ Jesus. We're just going to lift that up one more time. So if you join us, let's sing it out. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Amen. You may be seated. Good to see you this morning. If you're visiting for the first time, please grab that card in front of you, fill it out. You can drop it in the offering plate if you would like to take it back to the table in the back on your way out. We have a gift for you, a coffee mug. We want to give that to you. So fill that out for us so we can get you information about the church and what we have going on. So if you look at your bulletins, we have the Easter egg hunt. We're in the final countdown. That's the name of the sermon this morning as well. And uh, we are going to be uh, managing this. If you would like to help out in that, that is uh, how you can just click on that QR code and you'll be able to do that. We still need some volunteers. If you would like to help and jump in for Saturday's event, it is going to be great. We're meeting right after church. So please stick around if you could say, I can help. The, tell me what I need to do. You're going to be meeting right here after church. Miss Angela Miller is going to be helping set that up. Then Easter Sunday is at the community center. Everybody say community center. Yes. We're going to be over there. It's one hour service. There's no uh, connect group classes. We're going to get together. We'll have our children, everybody in there all at the same time. We're going to get in and out quickly, but we want to be able to impact the church. Church family, our deacons, our, our uh, men's group uh, have all been informed on what they need to do in order to um, impact our community. We, y'all, what we need is people just to see reality. They just need to see the love of Christ in you. Amen? So everybody go like this. You got three uh, people that you are praying about, and you are going to be able to invite those guys or, and ask them. And we want to give you a QR code. You can click on that. I'm giving you permission to take your phones out, and you can click on this QR code or this one right here, and then you're going to have a cool little thing to invite those three people with. So you can shoot that to them and say, hey, we're having uh, Easter here at the community center. Would love to have you uh, show up and sit next to me. And you can share that to three or 10 or your whole phone list, whatever you want to do. So you share that. And, uh, but think of those three people you've been praying about for the last uh, three weeks now. And uh, we'll go from there. And then if you flip that over to the back, If you don't have our app, that's where you need to grab that from, and you can have everything that's going on in the church, what's going on, our events here and abroad, all those things are plugged in right there. And finally, thank you for your giving. You can do that here at the bottom if you would like. That's between you and the Lord. You are impacting the community because of your faithfulness. We thank you so much for that. We thank you for what you're doing to impact our community. At the Walker campus here, uh, the church in Montana is just growing like a weed, and we just want to thank you for what you have done and what you have done to impact. Pray this week. Pray for your family. Pray for our friends. Pray to be bold about our faith, to invite people to church and say, man, I want you to come sit next to me, but you be the catalyst because possibly you may be the first picture of the gospel these people may have ever seen. And so be that, and uh, I'm praying for you as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are. We thank you for just your love, your grace, your mercy. We thank you for the season that we're in. And God, as we look at that, as we ponder it, as we 
understand this great decision for you to walk into Jerusalem and to walk out with the cross. Intentionally. We're moved. Because our face had to go through your mind on that cross. And God, as we lift our voices in song, as we hear from your word, I pray that you would speak to us in a great and profound way. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all of God's people said, amen. 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 Pastor Ben. Thank you, Pastor Tom. Oh, hey, can you give us an update on what we did for BJ's yeah, deal uh, yesterday? Just church, thank you so much for what yesterday we had a little fundraiser for BJ and uh, they're just overwhelmingly thankful for how you turned out. We actually sold out of everything that we had cooked yesterday. So Amen. big props to that. And, and even better, in the middle of the event, even better, we got a message um, just for more good news and more answered prayers where God has just been faithful and continually walking. So keep them in your prayers as they are walking through this, but be incredibly grateful and just praise God for all the answered prayers that we're seeing in the midst of it. So thank you guys. Amen. Amen. Do we have a, a number of what they raised for him to help in this whole deal? What is that number? Miss? A lot. <laughs> Just give me a, the roundabout. $4,000. This guy is uh, to help to help take care of that. Brother uh, Gidry, his dad and mom are back there. Brother Gidry, you want to say something in, in regard to that? Amen. 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 Love y'all. Pastor Ben. Well, on that note, church, let's stand together and just greet those to the left and the right of us this morning.
songs today as we give you this offering now. God, we do all things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. It's 
where your love ran red and my sin washed white. I owe all to you. that you would speak to us and we ask it all in his name and everyone said amen amen if you have your bibles open them up to the gospel of john we are going to be bouncing around in the Gospels. This morning I'm answering a question that was posed by our church in our survey that we do annually, and that is like, what is happening with Jesus from today, Palm Sunday, all the way up to this next Sunday? What exactly transpires here? And so we're going to look at that, and we're going to look at the significance it has uh, in our lives and how it would impact us and what the significance of those things uh, occurred. In this sermon entitled The Final Countdown, uh, we are going to pick up uh, from there. We're going to be looking at uh, all of the Gospels. They're all in there and annotated for you to, to know where you can get specifics about what I'm talking about, but I've summarized with those scriptures what ex exactly occurred. Let's pray first. Father, we come before you and ask that you open our hearts and minds to your word. Help us to understand these great truths. For Father, truth is the person of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, that as we uh, read from your word, as we hear from your spirit, that you would speak directly to us, that our yes would be yes, our no would be no, but there would be no gray area in our life as we discern the great love you have for us. For we ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Well, on day one in your notes there, we have Palm Sunday. That's today. So we're a week out. Remember last week what occurred? Most theologians say this uh, encounter with Lazarus happened three to ten days prior to uh, him coming in on this donkey on Palm Sunday. And we're going to note uh, some of the scripture here because we're going to start out in chapter 12 of the Gospel of John of what they, what, how that had an impact on the people who were there and why they were standing there with palm fronds and their coats and stuff and throwing them down there as Jesus enters into Jerusalem. So on this first day of Holy Week, which many of you uh, were brought up in the tradition of understanding how that is, uh, Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey while crowds are welcoming him. They're waving branches and shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We just sung this. Now, by saying this, the crowds are calling Jesus the son of God. They're acknowledging what has occurred. There is a big movement of what has happened since Lazarus' resurrection. Jesus rides on a donkey fulfilling a Jewish prophecy, and this dramatic entry is uh, growing crowds start to heighten the existing tensions between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. Now, all of those scriptures there are referenced uh, in, in for you. These are the, all the scriptures that talk specifically about him riding in. Well, Jesus enters Jerusalem. I want you to look, though, um, at chapter 12, 
verses 12 through 19 of the Gospel of John. And we're going to get some insight here on why this crowd was so excited about him. And we're going to get some insight on why the Pharisees were so ticked off at Jesus. So it says, verse 12, the Gospel of John, chapter 12. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Now, now catch that because that is unnerving for the Pharisees to hear the crowd shouting those kinds of things. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it as, is, as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. This is a prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9 and how it is fulfilled that it says that this king is going to ride in on a donkey. It's significant we understand donkey versus a horse because a horse was a king of war and a donkey is a beast of burden or signifies peace. And so this idea of being fulfilled that the king was coming in lowly and humble to bring peace to the world is fulfilled right here out of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. And so we read on, um, verse 16, these things his disciples did not understand at first. Now they're starting to clue in. We're right before Easter. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. So the scripture verse in verse 16 is saying, hey, they are getting it. They, Zechariah, this is his fulfillment. He is doing exactly what the prophets had said. This is the guy. This is possibly the Messiah. Now, next week when we preach, we're going to do a dual preaching thing, like dueling banjos. Not really, but kind of. Me and Pastor Wade are going to preach the pre disciples and the post disciples and the difference of what those are and how we sometimes have a preconceived notion of who God is. And when it doesn't come out our way, oftentimes we go, man, I didn't, this is not how I thought it was supposed to be. I thought it was going to be better than this, or I thought, I thought this was going to happen. We'll have this preconceived notion. We're going to see this happen with these disciples as they have formulated some thoughts about who Jesus is and how this kingdom was going to take over. But we'll get to that in the next week. These things, it says the disciples did not understand at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. Verse 17, so the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify about him. Put an asterisk next to verse 17. Now, this is a significant thing. We talked about this last sermon. I don't want to go after chasing last week's sermon, but these people who were at this guy's funeral were a lot of Pharisees and Sadducees and a lot of famous people. He was a famous businessman in town. Lazarus was known by these people. He was dead for four days. As we talked about last week, the tradition of a funeral lasts more than a week. So all these people are hanging out there. They know this guy's dead. They had already sealed it with wax because of the smell that would emanate from it. It was mentioned by uh, uh, Lazarus' sisters that it was going to stink. So this this phenomenon of all these people there for this funeral and Jesus calling him out. We see here in, ver in chapter 12 where they're going, this is what's caused the movement of these people being so excited about who Jesus is. And so these guys are excited. They were there and they continued to testify about him, him capitalized, that is Jesus. Verse 18, for this reason also the people went and met him because they heard that he had performed this sign. So th this is the dude who raised Jesus from the dead. And, and we want to go see this guy. The guys who had heard about it wanted to see this guy. They knew Lazarus was dead, and now that he's alive again. And they want to go see this guy. So they are showing up there as Jesus rides in. Verse 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. Put an asterisk next to verse 19. That's a tough statement. Momentum is in high gear. And the Pharisees are ticked off that they are losing people to this Jesus movement. And they're like, this is, this is going to put a hurt on us. Now, I want you to dwell about the character there for a moment. Because oftentimes, if we don't remain centered on Jesus Christ, if we don't continue to preach the truth of God, 
uh, the church is going to cease to grow. And there are our churches, when we look at statistically at churches across the United States, they're not growing. And, and I, I struggle with that. And I'm wondering why, what is, the, what is the trend that the churches are on a decline? And I believe it's because we've gone to this preaching of tickling people's ears and tearing out the pages that offend people. And we don't want to preach those things because we think, oh, I'm going to hurt his feelings. Oh, I'm going to hurt her feelings. Oh, whatever. You know, I don't, I want you to just kind of feel good and let's group hug it. Church, listen to me. A group hug is not going to get you into heaven. Amen. You need to know the truth of Jesus Christ. That is the only thing that can save you and save me. You are not following me. We are all following Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. There is nobody in here walking on water. We need to understand that truth. So these guys are ticked off in verse 19. We get an insight of the Pharisees because they're losing prophets. Man, not prophets like bringing the word, prophets like cash. Like this is going to put a hurt on the church. Well, day two is Monday. That was Sunday. He rides into Jerusalem. Everybody's on this high. They all are coming from a week where they realize Lazarus is raised from the dead. They all show up. They're dropping these palm fronds in. As he's coming in on this donkey, everybody's shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're excited. Monday comes. Jesus clears the temple. A lot of people ask me about this who have shot questions when we do our survey. They're like, why did Jesus lose his mind on Monday? Is that really what God is supposed to do? Let's, let's take a look at exactly what's happening here. So on Monday, Jesus curses a fig tree for not bearing fruit. Now, the curse may have been a metaphor for God's judgment on the spiritually dead religious leaders, which we just talked about, and, and, and or a warning for all believers against the life that, watch this, for a life, watch this, that looks religious on the outside, but isn't genuine on the inside. And he's ticked off. Jesus goes on to visit the main temple in the city and finds the courts full of corrupt people. He flips tables and clears out the temple, saying the scriptures declare my temple will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. That's located in Luke chapter 19 and verse 46. I want you to understand that Jesus is ticked off because the people he is looking at in the temple are not going to heaven. He is trying to get their attention. He is he's saying, you are, you are portraying or, or, or giving off this vibe that this is the kind of thing you need to do in order to be religious and to be right with God. Watch this. And it is not. So Jesus is ticked off at the example that's being set by the leadership in there, by the people in there who are believing what these people are are selling in the way of of Christianity, not Christianity, but in, 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 in Judaism under the law, they are ticked off at people being duped and Jesus is mad about this. Let's look at one of the chapters there, John again, chapter two, verse 13, where we get an insight of what's going on, the verses that I just read to you. They're causing these others to believe that what they are doing is right. And this is why Jesus ticked off. It says, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords. He was making a whip. Can you see Jesus just like walking in going? And he's looking at the tables, and he's putting this thing together. He's tying these cords together. And now he is about to make a statement. He made a scourge, verse 15, out of cords, or a whip, if you will, and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. And stop making my father's house a place of business. Verse 17, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. I want you to note significantly how John keeps reminding or writes down the fact that the disciples, which is not mentioned oftentimes in the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but oftentimes the disciples here under John are being reminded of the prophecies that are being fulfilled, which is strengthening them in the belief of who he is and who they're following. But there's going to be some changes. There's going to be some worry. Watch this. I don't care how strong of a Christian you are today. If you are a Christian and a believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to go through trials in your life. 
and you're going to get a curveball in your life and you are going to struggle. We all are. The Bible says not if you go through trials. It says when you undergo various trials. And, but it says consider it all joy, my brethren. But the reason or the fact that I need you to grasp is this. If you're coming here thinking that by becoming a Christian, you're going to have a life with rose petals going for the rest of your life, that's not going to happen. We are called to be set apart from the world and to live our life in a way that when people look at us, they see Jesus Christ in us. If you're going to embrace the world, if we're going to listen to the world, if we're going to listen to their ideals, then the only thing to separate truth and discern truth from that is by, uh, by comparing it to this. Not to a man, not to a woman, not to whoever you're following on YouTube, but to the gospel and to the word of God found in the scripture. Amen? That is the only thing that we are to compare that to. Well, that was a day, Monday was a day where they're flipping out and people are like, man, he's ticked off. Well, he's ticked off at the fact that there was such a horrible example of religion set to the people, and watch this, and the people were following it. Day three comes along, it's Tuesday. Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives, just east of Jerusalem. It's separated by the Kidron Valley. And there he goes. The religious leaders are at this time feeling increasingly threatened by the way that the mass crowds are recognizing Jesus as a spiritual authority and even as the Son of God. Jesus leaves the city to a place called the Mount of Olives. He delivers his famous sermon slash speech called the Olivet Discourse, which is a prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the age. He speaks in parables, which are stories or metaphors that have, been, have hidden meanings in them that you would get if you understood the truth of which direction it was going, but maybe not if you didn't understand or were not following. It, it is also believed that on Tuesday, Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, negotiated with the Jewish leaders a price and a plan to portray Jesus. That's in Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 through 16, this particular piece that we're talking about. Let me read it to you, chapter 14. And then one of the 12, named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me to betray him? Put an asterisk next to verse 15. I think it's interesting that he can't say Jesus. He says him. I think when you're betraying someone, I think it's easy to distance yourself from them. I think it's easy to, to just ignore it or not have to deal with it. But when you have to deal with the fact that you know a person intimately, it's a little bit tougher to do. We see kind of this deal happen in the heart of this guy. What are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him. Verse 16. From then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. Have you, have you ever wanted a quick fix? Just the thing to cut the corner? To serve yourself and yet disregard the fact that it might hurt others? Have you ever been there? Maybe when you were growing up? I, I've been there. I've taken those shortcuts a few times in my life growing up. There was a time in my life where I thought, you know what, I just, I, let me just do this thing so that uh, I can make it a little bit easier at home or make it a little bit easier on myself. And this is the thinking of Judas Iscariot. He's like, you know what, what what's good for me? Because he's not certainly thinking about the other disciples. He's not thinking about Jesus Christ. He's not thinking about the cause of Christ or what's going on. Watch this. He's only, watch this, he's only thinking about himself. This is Judas. This is the character of the one, one of the disciples that were looking like they were serving the Lord, but thought nothing of destroying those around them or for the matter of the cause of Christ. Rising tensions are going to continue after the Olivet Discourse. The scriptures are there for you. I'd allude to one of the scriptures it says, a battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. This is the thing that the Pharisees are ticked off about. What do you mean 
you're bringing our religion to a group of people who are pagans. What do you mean that you are going to try to serve these people? Let, let, let's 2024, right where, we are, where, right where we are. What do you mean we're going to go serve those people under the bridge? What do you mean we're going to go serve those people in the trailer park over on that side? Let's serve this one, but not that one. What do you mean we're going to serve to that person who speaks a different language? What do you mean we're going to serve to that person who is a different color than me? What do you mean we're going to serve whatever it is that you want to put in there? We need to come to the point and the fact that God created every one of us and every one of our faces had to go through his mind on the cross. Amen? Amen. The Pharisees are losing their minds. Because people are being moved. Watch this. I want you to know why they're moved. It's because truth is black and white. Your emotion is triggered when you're confronted with truth. Now, there are religions out there that preach emotion. And they try to tell you that that emotion is the truth. That is not. The scripture is the truth. And if it emotionally moves you, then amen and pass the biscuits, right? Right? Because that's what needs to happen. But it is a definer of right and wrong. It leaves no gray area in there. And the people are moved because what they are seeing in Jesus Christ, they're like, this is for real. This is the real deal. The Pharisees are rebuked. Let me read on the the scripture verse that I was reading, which is out of John. It says, then a demon possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus and he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. This guy's blind and he's mute and he is now able to see and he is no longer mute. All the crowds were amazed, verse 23, and they were saying, this man cannot be the son of David. This is the Pharisee speaking. Can he? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. I want you to note something. The people were saying this of Jesus, that this guy, he, he, I take that back, I misspoke. The people said, man, this might be the Messiah. And these Pharisees are saying, no, this guy is doing this out of the devil. I want you to note something, put an asterisk next to verse 24. False theology is being inserted to confuse the people who are being swayed by Jesus Christ. I mean, I remember when I became a Christian, and I was the first guy in my family to become a Christian, and everybody thought, man, this guy's drinking purple Kool-Aid. You know, what, that, what, he is... He is a half a bubble off plum. What, what, is, what is wrong with him? Why is he not doing what we have always done with our family on, on, on holidays and stuff? Why is he not doing some of those things? I, I, was, I was markedly different. I was growing in Christ. I was allowing the Holy Spirit to grow in me. I was allowing and, to be discipled, and it was happening in my life, and it was changing me. I want you to note that these Pharisees insert a false theology in verse 24, verse 25. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, so he knows what they're doing. Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So the false teachers give a narrative that fits their emotional and personal desire. And this happens oftentimes when somebody's saying, well, let me give you my version uh, of what's going on there. And if it is not backed by Scripture, if you can't vet that through Scripture, you need to back up the pickup truck. If a guy's not going to preach to you from the Bible and use the Scripture to be able to bring that truth to you, he's going to give you his opinion, you need to find a new church. And the day that I start doing it, you need to leave here and go find another church because that would be wrong. You have to back up what you say with the scripture. Amen? These guys insert this narrative that's not even theologically correct. Jesus corrects their narrative, and he's like, what are you talking about? Look what he says. He goes on. Verse 27. If I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Watch this. When you find a good church, whether it's here or somewhere else, 
and they're preaching from the word. And you say, you know what? We need to get our family in there. We need to grow. You need to understand something. Watch this. God's word brings conviction to believers, and they are then moved by that. For the non-believer, the person sitting here who doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it isn't Tom Shepard that's convicting you. It is the Holy Spirit who comes to your door and knocks on the door and says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man opens that door, I will come into him and fellowship with him and he with me or dine with him, meaning a permanent relationship. Are you going to let me in permanently into your life? Are you going to let me speak to you so that I can answer the things that you struggle with? Are you going to let me into your life? And oftentimes our shame or our pride or our vanity will stop us and say, oh, you know what, can you come back later because I need to clean up. Watch this. You're never going to be able to clean up. Watch this. He already knows your mess. Watch this. And he still loves you. That's why he's knocking. And if we would just open the door and say, okay, he might ask us to help him clean up the mess. That's called a consequence. (laughs) It's when your mama catches you and your room is messy and you lied to her and told her it was clean and you went out and played anyway. We might have to help clean up the mess, but that's okay. Because when you let him into your life, he's going to give you the ability to do that much more effectively than you've ever done it before in your life. Amen? So he answers these things. We need to understand that he fixes the theology here and he says, this is what's happening. And we need to understand that if the church is going to teach the truth out of the gospel, out of the scripture, and stick to that alone, then um, it will be true. You'll see a result. The result will be people will be coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The result will be the church will continue to grow. The result is because of the Holy Spirit through God's word is what moves in people's hearts and changes them. Now, don't miss this. You can find a church where they have a perforated edition of the scripture that I'm not going to offend you and I can tell you, hey, everybody's going to heaven. And I can preach a message where you never get offended. And you know what? We'll be able to fill a stadium full of people like that. But the fact is, the truth, because you've omitted some of it, will not be able to actually set them free because they don't know the whole truth. Amen? Amen. Now, that's a tough thing, but that's something we need to embrace and say, okay, Lord, I'm following you. I'm, I'm cool with that. So here's the kicker. There has to be discipled growth after those Christians who've accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. That has to happen. This is why we teach Master Life in our church. This is why we have discipleship. This is why we have connect groups. This is why we do those things. If you're not in a connect group, if you've not gone through Master Life yet, you need to get with one of those leaders and say, hey, I I need to do that. I need to get to the next level. And your whole world is going to be changed. I was listening to uh, a brother this morning who was talking to me like I'd never had my uh, prayer life in my life as a Christian, and I am totally transformed by this. I I now journal, and I keep my my prayers there, and I am praying on a constant basis, and I'm doing those things, and I'm growing in Christ, and he is changed differently. The guy's been in church almost his whole life. What happens when, when that occurs? Watch this. It's when you give complete authority, or let me use this word, when you give complete lordship to Jesus Christ in your life. Amen? And he is, you're going to, instead of growing like this, you're going to go like this. And and it will be explosive. It'll be transformative in your life. Verse 29 says, Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. Watch this. You don't have the ability or power to overthrow Satan unless the Holy Spirit indwells you. Because it is then, the scripture says, he that is in you, Holy Spirit, is greater than he that is in the world. Amen? And so that's when it happens. Well, day four comes along, and it is uh, called Holy Wednesday. And there's a bunch of question marks there. Because there is no scripture verse that says anything about what happened on Wednesday. And so, you know, there's no record of what Jesus did on Wednesday in the middle of this Holy Week. It's expected, you know, that they rested maybe after two exhausting days in Jerusalem. At this point, tensions are reaching a boiling point where the religious leaders want to avoid causing an uproar in the city. 
and, and during the festival that is going on there in Jerusalem. But Jesus knows he'll be killed on the Passover, taking his place as a sacrificial lamb and God's provided rescue for mankind. There are no verses stating what Jesus did on this day. Some of us want to think that perhaps he went to a Wednesday night meal and had a Bible study. <laughs> I think the early church traditions came out of this on Wednesday to do a prayer meeting on Wednesdays because of that. And that's cool and all, but I'm not going to give you any type of authority that anything happened because the scripture doesn't say anything happened there. All we know is maybe Jesus took a day off. Watch this, dads. Watch this, dads. Watch this, Grandpa. Maybe you need to take a day off. Watch this, Grandma. Watch this, Mom. Maybe you need to take a day off. Stop. And look around you at those closest to you. And make sure. Everybody do this. That those people are coming on Sunday. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, day five comes. It's Passover Thursday. The tensions are mounting between Jesus and the religious leaders. Jesus and his disciples prepare to share in the Passover meal. Celebrating God, bringing them out of Egypt is why the celebration occurs on the Passover but through Judaism. But at this dinner, Jesus washes the feet of the disciples, an act of selflessness and foreshadowing of what he would do on Friday. You know what I think is significant here that you need to note? That Judas Iscariot was present when he washed their feet. I need you to understand that Jesus died for everybody in this room, not just for some of you. Amen? He didn't die for a certain elect group of people and destined the other people to go to hell. He died for the world. Because he loved the world. Watch this, because he loves you. Because he wants a relationship with you. But he doesn't want a robot. You could take your smallest child and shake them and say, you're going to tell me you love me every time I come home. And that child might, out of fear, say, I-, I love you, and run off to their room. But how much greater is it when your child runs to you and says, Daddy, you're home. And he hugs your leg, or Mama, you're home. And she hugs you. Because the love relationship that God wants with you is a two-way street, and he wants to consummate that with you. He wants you to understand his love he has for you, and he wants you to get it so that you would love him back. How do you do that? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. If you don't love me, you won't obey my commands. You consummate this love relationship with the one who created you by saying, okay, what do you want me to do? When Peter asked Jesus, how do I build the church? He said, with those people who would watch us, repent and be baptized. That's why you see people come forward at the end of the service. That's why you see these people getting baptized because they're making a line in the sand saying, I am choosing to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. And that's what they do. It's a decision to say, God, I understand you love me and I love you and I am going to live for you. Well, it's significant that he washed Everybody's feet, that means, watch this, the offer, watch this, is, watch this, for everybody sitting in here. Amen? Amen. Jesus changes the conversation at the Passover meal, and he tells the disciples that he is going to suffer. They probably don't get exactly what it is. You're going to see what the rest of that story is next week. He takes items from this important Jewish meal and gives them new meaning, saying of the bread, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We're going to do this in just a moment. We're going to do the Lord's Supper this morning because I want you to grasp what exactly God is doing here through his son, Jesus Christ, and what this really means. You know why we do it quarterly? Because I don't want it to become rote for you. I don't want it to become this thing that you just do every single time. It's not a thing that is going to to fix your sins by partaking in it. That is done when you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've repented of your sins and you have been baptized. You say, I am choosing to follow you. That is when that has been done. This is to come back to a place to remember what Christ has done for you. This is to get your heart right if you have anything against anyone else around you so that your heart can 
be right so that you can walk and do exactly what Jesus was ticked off about when he was flipping over the money changing tables. Don't be a contradiction to Christianity. Live your life out loud so that people could see Jesus Christ in you. So in doing this, he sets up a new Christian tradition of communion. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. He is taking care of the law. We talked last week about the law. The law is a mirror. You look at it, you're going to see how far off you are from it. And if you have dirt on your face and you choose to walk away from the mirror with the dirt on your face, you made that choice. But you have a basin in front of you that you can wash yourself clean of that thing. That basin is what Christ accomplished on the cross with the blood that he shed there. That is what cleanses you of all unrighteousness. That is the only thing that can cleanse you of that. He sets up this communion, which is... Why we Christians remember this Passover meal and the sacrifice, watch this, that Jesus made. After the meal, the group goes to the garden called Gethsemane, where he, his disciples, are going to go, and Judas is going to betray him. He hands him over to the Jewish leaders, and he is arrested and taken to the high priest for trial. The scripture verses are are there for you in John Chapter 13 and and verse 14, I'll read this to you. It says, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes, otherwise They would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. Jesus is speaking of this religion that had laid the law out that they had been living forever. Let me ask you a question, 2024, right where you are. Are you here because it's the Christian thing to do? Or are you here to actually hear what God has to say to you? Because those are two different things. And you're going to get burnt out on the first one if that's why you're here. It, it doesn't work. You have to say, God, I am listening. Watch this. Hear, see, believe. This is what Jesus outlines. And then it's Good Friday. Friday morning, Jesus went to the trial for the accusations from the Jews, but he did not defend himself. Instead, he outrages the religious leaders by calling himself the Son of God. Jesus was given a crown of thorns and made to carry a massive cross through the city and up the mountain called Calvary, where he was nailed to the cross alongside of two criminals. Then at the ninth hour, on the day of the most sacred Jewish festival, Jesus breathes his last breath. Friday evening, two men took the body and placed it in the tomb and rolled a stone over it. It's interesting to note that on Saturday, that would be the Sabbath for, those, for the Jewish believers, a day when Jewish people are commanded to do no work after the Sabbath ended at 6 p.m., People went to the tomb to do the ceremonial preparation for burial. Knowing that Jesus said he was going to rise again in three days, the Jewish leaders went to the Roman governors and requested that the tomb be guarded so that no one would steal the body and lie about his resurrection. Watch this. History writes this and confounds historians. Why do you have to go hide a body? Why would the Pharisees want to stop that from happening? Because what happened for the last two weeks when Lazarus is raised from the dead and they see this guy come in and they finally get this guy on some technicality that they make up and he doesn't defend himself though Pontius Pilate said, just tell me you're innocent and I'll let you go. The Bible says he remains silent. Why? For you. Because you and I do not have the ability to fix our life. And he will be the only one who can.
They guard the tomb. The governor put a seal on the stone, history tells us, that it's recorded history, to make sure that the body couldn't be stolen. Here's where it gets difficult. There is a pastor who I had the pleasure of meeting and knowing. His name was S.M. Lockridge, and he was a pastor in San Diego, California, my hometown. He was a pastor there for 40 years, from 1953 to 1993. That was the year that I would get ordained. He was known for his preaching across the United States. He was an African-American guy, and he was a great guy, but he had both African-Americans in his congregation. He had white people in his congregation. He had Koreans. He had Chinese. He had everybody in there because he just preached the gospel as it was. As the band comes forward, put your Bibles away. We're fixing to take the Lord's Supper here in a moment. But I want to leave you with something. It's a poem that... that that Pastor Lockridge wrote, S.M. Lockridge. S.M. stands for Shadrach and Meshach. The truth. Shadrach, Meshach, Lockridge. Put your Bibles away. If everybody has, if somebody does not have one of these and you've had believer's baptism, you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you've had believer's baptism, and you don't have any of these in your hand, raise your hand so that those guys in the back can get you one of those. I got one way over here. Got one right here. One over there. One in the middle. Just keep your hands up so they can give it to you. I want to read to you this poem these guys play before we take the Lord's Supper. You can take the cellophane off the top of that I want you to hold that piece of bread in your hand don't take it yet it's significant that before you take that bread watch this you need to be right watch this you need to be right with your brother or sister in Christ otherwise don't take it when we take the cup and we drink the cup you need to go to the Lord before you take that cup and say, God, forgive me for, and whatever that is that you have been struggling with, make sure you lay that at the altar of the Lord so that he can say, theologically, I know, and it is finished. One is to get right with mankind. One is to get right with the Lord. Before we take this, this is what we're remembering that Christ accomplished. Pastor Lockridge reminds us that it is significant that we do this in remembrance of him. Why? Because Friday comes and it looks like it's over. Your, your life possibly looks like it's over. But it's not. He writes, and I'll read it. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter's asleeping. Judas is betraying. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday, Pilate's struggling, the council is conspiring, the crowd is vilifying, they don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the disciples are running, like sheep without a shepherd, Mary's crying, Peter is denying, but they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the Romans beat my Jesus, they robe him in scarlet, they crown him with thorns, but they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Jesus is walking to Calvary. His blood's dripping. His body is stumbling. And his spirit is burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's a coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil is grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nail my Savior's hands to the cross. They nail my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raise him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have an opportunity this morning. I'll be down front. 
Pastor Cersei will be down here. Pastor Kevin will be down here. If you've never said, Lord, I need to make you the Lord of my life. Jesus, I need to make you the Lord of my life. You come and pray. We're not gonna embarrass you. I'm just gonna pray with you so you can receive that. And then we'll follow up with baptism like you've seen so many times here. And then you're gonna get it like these disciples did in John. Watch this. Buried with him and raised to the newness of life. Your old person dies. The new person that God gives you is found in him alone. Amen? If you need to make a decision before we do this Lord's Supper, you come forward and nail that down. For those of you holding that bread in your hand, you'd be praying for those who might need to do that. Let's stand together as you come. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I am Pastor Tom Shepard, the lead pastor at the Church at Addis. I pray you were blessed by God's word. If you're watching and would like to become part of this fellowship, there are two options. First, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and today's message spoke to you and perhaps convicted you in some way, I want to walk you through that right now. I will lead you through a prayer in a moment that is going to give you an opportunity to make an honest decision on whether you will choose to follow Jesus and make him Lord of your life. This is going to be a defining moment for you. If you desire that relationship with Jesus Christ, bow your head right where you are and repeat after me this prayer. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I might not know a lot about you, but I believe that you died on a cross and the blood you shed paid for my sins. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. My past, I am turning away from those sins and I am choosing to surrender to you as my personal Lord and Savior. I believe you were buried and raised again from the dead so that I could have eternal life. And I choose from this day forward to do my very best to follow you. For I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, now my Lord and Savior, amen. Hey, look at me for a second. If you just prayed that prayer and meant it, let me be the first one to say congratulations. You are now a child of God. There is nothing or no one who can take that away from you. In fact, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, that I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today or worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know what else? Luke 15, 10 says that every angel in heaven is shouting out for joy right now for your salvation. Isn't that awesome? I want you to do me a favor. If you're close enough, I want you to call us here at the church on the number you see below. I want to sit down with you or Zoom you in on a call if you're in another state or country and get some stuff in your hands that is going to take you on the most exciting, fulfilling journey in your lifetime. I look forward to meeting with you, getting to know you and getting you plugged in. Second, if you've already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been baptized as a new believer in Christ, but you are looking for a place to call home, all you need to do is email your name, address, and telephone number so that I may contact you via phone or Zoom or visit, whichever is convenient. We will then get you access to our extensive online discipleship curriculum, which is chock full of great stuff for you and your entire family. We will then get a packet out to you telling you all about your membership with your new church family. Accountability and fellowship are so important. Getting connected will solidify your growth and you will create some awesome new friends. I'm so excited about getting to know you and getting you connected on this new journey. Don't wait. Contact us now.